Okay, so good morning. Uh, we were looking at uh, projections and projections, general projection theorem in Hilbert spaces. So, in the last class, I talked about uh, distance of a vector or a point from a subspace in a general Hilbert space. So, we wanted to project just like we projected in three dimensions, we projected a vector onto a two dimensional surface. In the same way, uh, we could project a vector in general Hilbert space which could be infinite dimensional onto a subspace which is finite dimensional. Okay. So, this uh, we derived a formula or we derived equations for uh, computing the coefficients of the least square approximation and uh, so, we are looking at what is called as the normal equation. I will just go through over, over it uh, very quickly. Uh, what we wanted was we have a Hilbert space and uh, we have this subspace S. S is a subspace of uh, X is a subspace of S. And then we are given a vector u, a vector u that belongs to x, a vector u is given to you that belongs to x. Now, x may or may not belong to this subspace S. Okay? I want to find out the point in the subspace which is at a shortest distance in the least square sense uh, from u. So, what I essentially want to do is, so let us say, let us say S is equal to span of some ve basis vectors So, these are linearly independent basis vectors, there are m basis vectors and so, this is a finite dimensional subspace, S is a finite dimensional subspace. I want to find out, uh, so any vector that belong to this subspace will be of the form alpha 1 a 1. Any vector that belongs to S will be, will be a linear combination of these basis vectors. Okay. What I want to do is to find out, find out alpha 1 to alpha m such that 2 norm of u minus or let us say 2 norm square. I want to minimize some of the square of errors when it is finite dimensional, I want to minimize the integral, I want to minimize the integral if it is infinite dimensional space, I want to minimize this integral over the domain. This is 2 norm square that means inner product of this vector with itself. This is the error vector u is the original vector in x, this is the projection this p here is the projection, p here is the projection and then we want to find out a vector p that belongs to the subspace S which is at a minimum distance from. So, uh, what I wanted to emphasize again and again, it is not different from say this is the point okay, and this is my plane here, okay. this is two dimensional subspace and this is a point, the shortest distance of this point is obtained by dropping a perpendicular. Okay. So, what, what uh, classical projection theorem in Hilbert spaces says is that the way to go about, the way to find this vector p which is at the shortest distance is to use the fact that this error vector e 
that is uh, u minus p this is perpendicular to a i i going from 1 to m ok this error between the original vector and the projection the original vector and the projection this error vector is orthogonal remember that orthogonality can be used only in the inner product space or a Hilbert space and that is why uh, we work with two norm or least square approximations that is why uh, least square approximations are so uh, popular because you can use orthogonality ideas ok. So, this is this is the this is the basic idea with this we derived what is called as a normal equation this normal equation gave us way to compute the least square estimate of alpha 1 to alpha m and that we constructed as follows. So, we got this normal equation this was a 1 a 1 inner product of a 2 a 1 a 2 a m likewise Okay. So, using using the fact that the error is orthogonal to each of the basis vectors a 1 to a m, we arrived at this equation. This equation is called as the normal equation in Hilbert spaces. This when I solve this, these inner products, these are the inner products here. Once you compute this a 1 to a m, these basis vectors are known to you, you can compute their inner products. Okay. So, this will be a matrix what is the dimension of this matrix this will be a m cross m matrix there are m there are m vectors this will be m cross m matrix this m cross m matrix is invertible in fact it is symmetric positive definite invertible matrix you can check that. And then you can solve for alpha 1 to alpha m you can get a least square solution what you will get here is the least square solution of alpha 1 to alpha m ok. You will get the projection vector once you use this alpha 1 to alpha m you get the projection vector onto the subspace s which is at the least distance from u ok. So, this is the best approximation of now I began in the working on this using finite dimensional spaces I had derived a formula which said that a transpose a inverse theta. So, this in the finite dimensional spaces this just go back and have a look at what we have done this will reduce to the same thing will reduce to a transpose a this will reduce to theta this is this will reduce to a transpose u. In the finite dimensions this equation will reduce to ok the matrix equation which we have derived earlier. So, I am just extending the idea from finite dimensions to a general Hilbert space here I could work with any of the see for example, uh, exa uh, I began my uh, lecture last time by saying uh, I have this vector u t which is a plus b t and t belongs to 0 to 2 pi ok t belongs to 0 to 2 pi I want to find out an approximation p t which is alpha sin t plus beta cos t I want to find out approximation alpha sin t plus beta cos t ok. Let us say we can so for this for the time being let us take only 
two vectors. What are the two vectors? What is a1, a2 here? This is my a1 vector. This is my a2 vector. This is my a1 vector. This is my a2 vector. Okay. How do you find out alpha and beta? So, so what I have to do here to find out alpha beta? How do I set up the problem to find out least square estimates? So I have to find out sin t sin t sin t cos t. What is sin t cos t over 0 to 2 pi? Can you do this integrals? What is the inner product defined here? How is the inner product defined? Inner product between some f and g is integral 0 to 2 pi f t g t. Inner product is defined here like this. Okay. Inner product is defined here like this. So, so now we know that over 0 to 2 pi sin and cos are orthogonal. So this is 0, this is 0, okay. If you notice what we are actually deriving are the first two coefficients of the Fourier series. I am doing Fourier series expansion of ut in terms of sin and cos, okay. The nice property of sin and cos over 0 to 2 pi with this as my inner product is that they are orthogonal. So this is 0, this is 0. I get a diagonal matrix. Solving for this diagonal matrix is very, very easy. It is very, very easy. It is not so difficult to solve for. So what is integral sin t sin t? It is pi. Inner product of sin t u t and inner product of cos t u t. So this, this is equal to pi, this is equal to pi, this is 0, this is 0, okay. The least square estimate, the best estimate of in the least square sense in terms of sin and cos of this function ut, ut in this particular case I have taken a plus bt. It could be, it need not be, you know, the this kind of function. I can take for example ut to be any other complex function. I could take this as you know uh, 1 plus 5 t square minus 7 t cube sin t. Let us say this is my function, does not matter. This is a function okay, in the space of uh, in the set of continuous functions over 0 to 2 pi, it is a continuous function over 0 to 2 pi. Okay. I want to find out best approximation to this function using sin and cos. Okay. I can go on, if here I have included only two basis vectors, well somebody might say just using two is not sufficient, you want to use four, okay. in which case I would use sin t, cos t, sin 2t, cos 2t and so on. Okay. So the approximation could become more and more complex if you want. So I can have alpha 1, beta 1 plus alpha 2, sin 2t plus beta 2, cos 2t plus alpha 3, sin 3t plus beta 3, cos 3t. Let us say I want to develop an approximation like this to this problem. How will you do it? We just methodically apply this formula. Okay. Now, now there are six vectors. The subspace, what is the subspace span? Subspace span by six vectors. Sin t, sin 2t, sin 3t, cos t, cos 2t, cos 3t. We want to find out best approximation of the given function. Okay. Best in the least square sense. 
okay. In the subspace spanned by these 6 vectors, what I do is I find out these inner products, okay. I evaluate these inner products between 6 vectors, this gives me this matrix. On the right hand side, I have to compute inner product of the given function with each of the vectors, okay. And uh, when these vectors are orthogonal, actually what we recover is the Fourier series expansion, the Fourier coefficients, okay. When these are orthogonal, you know, only the diagonal elements of this matrix will be non-zero, okay, only diagonal elements will be non-zero. All the off diagonal elements will be 0 because orthogonal vectors inner products are 0. If I take an orthogonal set, why do we actually want to approximate something using an orthogonal set? That is because uh, the projection problem, approximation problem gets very, very simple, okay. Also there are some other advantages like uh, actually, actually what you are doing here is you are, when you do this orthogonal projections, you are expressing a vector in terms of its orthogonal components. Why do we, why do we work with x i y j plus z k in three dimensions? Because x is a component along, you know, unit vector in the x direction, y is the component along, okay. They are, they are orthogonal, they are not related to each other, okay. They are not related to each other. The same way, what we are doing here is that we are expressing a vector in terms of a basis, okay. We are projecting onto orthogonal basis. Now the complete vector you can write if you take all, when you, when, see if I take a vector uh, x which is given by three coordinates x, y, z, okay. When will I get, when will I get the entire vector? If I take all the three components together. In the infinite dimensional space, when I, when will I get entire vector? If I take all the basis, if I take all the basis vectors and take, you know, projections along each one of them, okay, if I take projections along each one of them, then I will get uh, the Fourier series. I will just write down this whole thing, it will become more clear. But there is one more thing I just want to tell you. See, these vectors right now, I have chosen them to be orthogonal. I have not chosen them to be orthonormal. If I choose them orthonormal, what will happen? Suppose these vectors are orthonormal. What is the property of orthonormality? Inner product is equal to 1, right? And inner product between a i, a j is 0 and with itself is equal to 1. What will happen to this matrix if I take orthonormal vectors? This will be identity matrix. If I take orthonormal vectors to find out the projection all that I have to do, okay, is to, okay, so, so the concept is not different from, I will just leave this and come back there. So the concept is not different from, see if I have this three dimensional vector, if I, if I have three dimensional vector V belongs to R3, okay. How do you find out the component of V along X axis? I take inner product of V with I, I is the direction. So I am talking here about, this is my IJK orthogonal basis for three dimensional space, okay. If I take inner product of V with I, what will I get? I will get x component, right? I get x component. Inner product of V, y component is inner product of V with j and z component is inner product of V with k, right? How do we write, how do we write this vector, how do we express this vector? We express this vector as V is equal to x i plus y j plus z k where i j k, uh, let us put this cap here, let us say they are unit vectors, i cap, j cap, 
and k cap are unit vectors okay but this this writing is same as inner product v i i plus inner product v j i could as well write this like this right this and this is same you agree with me okay here what we can do is that in a general hina product space if you are given a basis now this x is my inner product space or hilbert space okay is a hilbert space and i give you us a basis so this hilbert space could be any any of the hilbert spaces that we have looked at okay uh, so need not be need not be just finite dimensional it could be any of the infinite dimensional hilbert spaces that we have looked at and then i give you a set of orthonormal basis in this see for example i can create uh, if it is 0 to 1 you know i can create shifted legendre polynomials with which are orthonormal okay i can create a basis which is shifted legendre polynomials which is orthonormal and i can use that to uh, you know uh, define a subspace so so in general you are given a basis set you are given a basis i will call this as e1 e2 en this could be a finite basis this could be an infinite basis depending upon what kind of inner product space you are looking at okay if you are looking at set of continuous functions twice integrable continuous functions then this will be infinite basis okay so so i may have finite number i may have infinite number of elements in my basis set these are orthonormal vectors what is the meaning of orthonormal vectors orthonormal vectors which means ei ez is equal to 0 if i is not equal to z, is not equal to j and this is equal to 1 if i equal to j if i is equal to j then this is equal to 1 these are orthonormal vectors their magnitude is 1 and they are orthogonal to each other okay so this is the orthogonal basis this orthogonal basis is same as i j k that we consider in three dimensions why do we like i j k in three dimensions it's orthogonal basis it's very nice okay i can express any vector in terms of components along each direction okay the same thing is true about any in a product space now how do i express an arbitrary vector an arbitrary vector u that belongs to the in a product space how do i express this vector in terms of this basis how do i get those components i can use the i want to project what i want to do i want to project this vector onto the space spanned by space spanned by all possible linear combinations of this okay let's take There are there is an infinite set, okay. So, so the if you start writing the normal equation, what will be the matrix? Matrix will be I, because because you know because of orthonormality, this is one. If it is e diagonal elements will be one, of diagonal elements will be zero. Okay. So by virtue of this, okay, you will get the coefficients. if you start writing the normal equation you will get coefficients you will get coefficients i into this vector say alpha 1 alpha 2 and so on this is equal to in a product of u with e1 in a product of u with e2 and so on because this is i on the left hand side 
you have orthonormal vectors okay the inner products are between uh, i not equal to j or 0 in the product of with itself is equal to 1 so the left hand side is all i and i which is of infinite dimension let's say if there are infinite vectors i of infinite dimension okay so these are the coefficients how did we write the vector here we wrote the vector v as v component of v along i times i times in the sense this is to the direction i plus component of v along j times j and so on okay same thing i can do here in the inner product space i can write the vector u as inner product of u e1 e1 plus inner product of u e2 e2 plus is everyone with me on this is this clear i am just writing this vector u now i am not approximating when i take the basis when i take this e1 e2 e3 e4 en or e infinity whatever it is when i take this as a basis okay i am not approximating it is equality okay if you have infinite basis you will get infinite sum here so this is equal to sigma i equal to 1 to infinity u e i Okay, actually what I have written here is generalized Fourier series expansion of any vector u in terms of orthonormal basis in fact. Okay, so actually, actually when you write this, just remember this, when you are writing this, you are actually writing Fourier expansion of v. You are writing Fourier expansion of v, okay, in terms of orthonormal basis, that is what you are doing. I am just using the same idea in any other space. Probably when you studied Fourier series for the first time in your second year or third, second year of engineering, yeah, you start wondering why. I mean, somebody comes and says, take this function and write it as sine and cos. What do I, what do I gain out of it? Okay, actually what you are doing is same thing as writing xi plus yj plus zk, what you do in three dimensions. It is nothing different. Same idea extended to any other Hilbert space, any other general space. What is nice about orthogonal basis? You know, you can look at individual components separately. Okay, you can look at individual components separately. It is very, very easy to work with orthogonal vectors. We know that in three dimensions, that is what we want in any other three dimensional vector space. That is what we do not want to do in any other vector space, which is a Hilbert space. It is possible only when you have in the product you have definition of you know angle generalized otherwise it is not possible to do this that is why Hilbert spaces that is why least square approximations are so important you know in engineering or most of the applications why we look at least squares why we use two norm all the time why not one norm why not infinite norm okay because two norm comes tied up with angle orthogonality you know everything that is nice in three dimensions okay so this is generalized Fourier expansion. If I if I give you if I give you a general function, say a specific example of this would be the the classical Fourier series which you study in second year of engineering is for the space uh, x is for this is the set of continuous functions over either minus pi to pi or we study over zero to two pi right square integrable functions over minus pi to pi or 0 to 2 pi this is where you look at these expansions and then we are given this basis vectors unfortunately sin cos are not orthonormal they are orthogonal okay and if you remember you get when you when you are when you are taught this Fourier series you get this you know uh, a i is equal to 1 by pi integral Remember this formula? Ai 1 by pi, then 0 to 2 pi, ft sin it dt, something like this, right? Where does this pi come from? 
this pi comes, why does this pi come? I mean, I used to have this problem when I studied this. Why suddenly put pi there? First of all, remember that this is, this is nothing but, this is nothing but inner product of ft sin it divided by inner product of sin it sin it. Okay. This is the normalizing factor 1 by pi which comes because sin it is not an orthonormal vector. I want to get an orthonormal direction. So, this is this is what it is. Okay. In this Fourier expansion, just look at how will you find the coefficients. See, this is my Fourier expansion. Okay. If I take if I take inner product, if I take inner product of u, if I take u e j, what will I get? u e 1 in a product of u e 1 is 0, u e 2 is 0, u e 3 is 0, right? What will I get? You will get u e j, you will get u e j back because in a product of e j with e j is 1, right? In a product of e j with e j is 1 and in a product of e j with e i, i not equal to j is 0, okay. So, all the terms in this series will cancel, only one term will remain that is projection along e j, okay. So, this very very nicely ties up with your x i plus y j plus z k which you know from three dimensions. Just remember that Fourier series is nothing but, nothing but extending this idea into a, okay. So, so far, uh, nice. So, uh, we have little bit uh, diverted because we are not going to use Fourier series in this course, but Fourier series will be useful in the mathematical methods course. We'll be, we'll be looking at all kinds of Fourier series, you know, in terms of Bessel's function and in terms of some other familiar names will appear, but now they should fall in a place, you know, you should be able to see them in light of this general development of what is projections onto orthogonal spaces. Yeah, not subspace in R3, three dimensional subspace in R4, R3 would be a, yeah, perpendicular will lie in R4, perpendicular will lie outside R3, perpendicular will lie outside R3, okay. So, actually you are splitting you are splitting a vector into two components, one along R3, one orthogonal to R3, which will of course lie in the general space. So, this Fourier series is just a side note, it is, uh, it is important here of course, but uh, it is more important when you develop analytical solutions. Okay. So, before we move on, I, you know, I am still not coming to applications to uh, boundary value problems or PD. But before I move on, I want to explain something which is uh, very, very important. Well, I have been telling you that, you know, uh, using polynomial ap approximations, okay, uh, or polynomial interpolation, high dimensional polynomial interpolation is the problem. Same thing is true about actually polynomial approximations. If you start, if you start developing a polynomial approximation, which is even if you have a large data set, if you have a polynomial approximation of this form, I have a function f t in uh, which belongs to set of continuous functions over 0 to 1, okay. And then I want to write, I want to develop an approximation p t which is you know alpha 0 plus alpha 1 t plus alpha 2 t square alpha m t to power m. I want to develop this approximation, okay. So, how do I go about doing this? What are the basis vectors now? 1 t t square up to t to power m, okay. I should set up the normal equation. 
how should be the normal say my my inner product here my inner product is defined as 0 to 1 ft my inner product is defined like this okay well uh, there are two ways of looking at this problem i am i so let's say i know the continuous continuous function over the entire domain then i can approximate the other problem that we have looked at earlier is you know if you know this function at the finite number of points okay if you know this function at finite number of points let's say n points then it's the uh, we will took this not ft we took this ut if i know u at finite number of points then i found, found that formula right a transpose a inverse that uh, least square approximation formula which is which can be used to okay this is this is uh, this is knowing the function at every point if i know ft let's say ft is some function like uh, tq plus phi sin t or whatever okay so this is a function which i know over the entire domain everywhere and i want to do an approximation well so just to give you an insight why polynomial approximations are ill conditioned i kept on telling you that you know uh, polynomial approximations are ill conditioned high order polynomial approximations that's why you have to do in in uh, orthogonal collocations we do piecewise polynomial approximations we have this spline functions so spline is fitting a low order polynomial by dividing the entire region into smaller segments okay why we do all this business so that's why now i want to explain you through this okay so the question is now here a uh, classic problem i want to develop a m third order polynomial approximation now what i know from weierstrass theorem is that i can develop an approximation arbitrarily close to the function see this only tells you there exists a polynomial which is it doesn't tell you how to reach that polynomial how to find is a different story okay weierstrass theorem only gives you existence now when it comes to actual computing there can be trouble unless you do some smart tricks unless you do some smart tricks okay so what are the smart tricks we'll come to that okay so let's first look at this problem m third order m is let's say large i want to have some 10 third order polynomial fitted here okay and my ut is let's take some ut which is ut is 5t square minus minus 70 cube sin t this is the ut i want to develop a 10th order polynomial approximation of this function in the least square sense what is the meaning of least square sense that means the two norm two norm of difference between ut and pt should be smallest okay we know that this can be found by using normal equation so we go about you know finding out this inner products so my inner product is 1 with 1 then 1 with t 1 with t to power m right i am constructing the normal equation okay i want to estimate the square estimates of alpha 1 to alpha m okay then sorry t with 1 t with t and t with t to power m and so on so this this times this times alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m and then how do i get the right hand side in the product of 1 with my ut in the product of t with ut and so on in the product of t to power m with ut and uh, you know classical projection theorem tells us that if you solve this you will get alpha 1 to alpha m okay now let me tell you what is this integral well these integrals may not be that difficult to evaluate right because you know polynomial integral 0 to 1 okay you can actually write a general formula for this uh, so if this matrix 
this matrix uh, in my notes I have called this as H matrix. This is m plus 1 cross m plus 1 matrix. There are m plus 1, oh sorry, there are alpha 0, alpha 1, right? We start with alpha 0, alpha 0, alpha 1, not alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 0, alpha 1. So, this is a matrix which is, this matrix is m plus 1 cross m plus 1, matrix is m plus 1 cross m plus 1, okay. What is the element of this? So, ijth element of this is given by 0 to 1 t to power i plus j minus 2 dt. This is equal to 1 upon i plus j minus 1. Well, why I have called this h will become clear soon because this what you get here is a famous matrix called Hilbert matrix. Okay. You can show that you can show that elements of this matrix. See, these are inner products of t square, t cube, t4, t to the power 5. So, I have just given a formula for general ijth element of this. You can very easily verify this. You will get this. Okay. Now, if I actually compute this, if I actually compute this and then fill in the fill in the matrix, okay, the matrix that I get here is like this. It is a very, very nice looking matrix 1 by 2, 1 by 3, 1 by m, 1 by 2, 1 by 3, 1 by 4, 1 by m plus 1, 1 by m, 1 upon 2m minus 1. This matrix is very, very difficult to invert. It is a highly ill conditioned matrix. Now, yet we have to define what is ill conditioned matrix. We have to wait a little bit for defining ill conditioning formally. Okay. But what you get here is a matrix. Okay. Uh, just to preempt what, what it means is that this is a basically, first of all, remember that this is a symmetric matrix. Okay. This is a symmetric matrix. Not only that, it is a positive definite matrix. Okay. This follows from the fact that this is actually, uh, you know, what we have obtained in the case of projection. This is a projection mat. This is obtained by, you know, projection matrix, it is obtained from projection matrix, it is related to the projection matrix. So, this is, this is actually a symmetric positive definite matrix, but it is highly ill conditioned because the eigenvalues of this matrix are very, very strange. The ratio of the highest eigenvalue to the smallest eigenvalue, okay, which is what for a symmetric positive definite matrix, which is what will define ill conditioning, we will see this later systematically, is so large that computations become impossible, very, very difficult. Okay. So, Hilbert matrix more than 4 or 5 m that is third or fourth order polynomial becomes difficult to invert. Okay. If you ask MATLAB to invert Hilbert matrix, it will give you some junk and say that do not believe the results. Okay. It will tell you that this matrix is ill conditioned. It will say it for, it will say it in a nice way, not, uh, not, it will not tell you do not believe the results. It will say that the real, the, 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 the solution may not be reliable. Okay. This matrix is highly ill conditioned. It will give you a number R conditioning is equal to something. When you do not know what, what, when you are done, not done all this theory, you just tend to ignore MATLAB is giving something. Very, very important message that your results could be completely unreliable. Now, to get, to get alpha 1 to alpha m, I need to invert this matrix. Okay. But if this matrix is highly ill conditioned, you know, the inverse is unreliable. If inverse is unreliable, alpha 1 to alpha, alpha 0 to alpha m calculated are unreliable. Okay. And then you are fitting, you know, a wrong polynomial because, not because, uh, you know, your formulation is wrong, but you just cannot compute properly, you know. There is no way of computing. You are stuck because this is an ill-conditioned problem. Okay. This is an ill-conditioned problem. And, but well, if you are smart enough and 
done this course and still remember things that I have taught you, uh, you will say, well, that is not a way to go. I do not want a nil condition matrix here. Okay. So, if I want to do polynomial approximations, what I will do instead is instead of using this raw polynomial like this, I would choose to use orthogonal or orthonormal polynomial. Okay. On 0 to 1, what is the orthonormal polynomial that we have constructed earlier? Shifted Legendre polynomials. Okay. So, instead of developing this approximation, instead of developing this approximation, see this, if I want, if you want an equivalent of three dimensions, what you are doing here is you are trying to express a vector in terms of vectors which are not orthonormal or orthogonal. See, a given vector, if I, if I give you one vector, say this one, okay, I can choose to express this in terms of three orthogonal components or basis need not be always orthogonal, basis can be any three linearly independent vectors. Okay. So, see the basis need not be like this, even basis is like this, three linearly independent vectors. Okay. But if the three linearly independent vectors are something like this, which are very close to each other, you may have trouble expressing this any vector in terms of these three vectors. Just because they are linearly independent does not mean they are convenient. Okay. Orthogonal vectors are convenient, you know, because you can express them in a very nice manner. So, what you would do instead, of, instead of using this polynomial, you would say, I will express this Pt as alpha 1, say, L1 t plus alpha 2 L2 t alpha m L m t. What, does, what are these L m? These are shifted, these are shifted general polynomials. Okay. I do not have to worry here now about the order I take. Why? I do not have to worry because when I use shifted general polynomials, I am not going to get the Hilbert matrix. By the way, in MATLAB, if you want to play with Hilbert matrix, just use command H I L B and give into the, you know, into bracket the dimension you want. H I L B 5 will give you Hilbert matrix of 5 cross 5. It will generate this matrix, same matrix. Okay. Uh, and just, just use inverse of that Hilb. Okay. It will crib that. <laughs> this matrix is ill condition. Try to multiply inverse into that matrix. MATLAB is fairly good till 12th H12, it does a very nice job. But beyond H12, that is 12 cross 12, it starts breaking. Okay. So, amazing that even for so highly ill condition matrices, it is able to do it. Now, okay. If I use the Legendre polynomials, what will happen to this, this matrix? This matrix will not be a full matrix because, okay, let, let us call them instead of alpha 1, alpha 2, let us call them some other numbers. So, you will get confused otherwise. Say beta 1, beta 2, some other, the coefficients are different because the basis has changed, the coefficients are different. So, now, if I want to find out beta 1, beta 2 to beta m, I have to take here inner products, inner products will change inner products will change. This will be L1 u, this will be L2 u and this will be L m u. Now, what about this matrix? What we know is that for shifted general polynomials, okay, inner product of L i L j is equal to 0 if i is not equal to, if i is not equal to j. What will happen to off diagonal elements? 0. What will be the diagonal elements? If, if I take orthonormal, 1. Okay. This will be just 1, 1, 1, 1. This will be a 0 here. This will be a 0 here. Right? I do not have problem of... So, if I want to develop a high order polynomial approximation, Okay. It is easier to go through the root of orthonormal polynomials than to use the raw, you know, 1t, t square t, cube t to the power 5 and so on. 
Is it clear? Why, why we are obsessed with orthogonality? Why we, why we, are, we want orthogonality so much in every application? That is because of this nice property. If I take shifted degenerate polynomials which are orthonormal, this matrix, which in earlier case was the Hilbert matrix of highly yield conditioned, I couldn't invert. Now see, this is the best matrix. There's no better matrix to invert than the identity matrix, right? So you get identity matrix, okay? You get the projections, and now there is no problem with what order you go, okay? So it's not that you are not developing a higher order polynomial approximation, except you just turn around, change the basis, you get much better solution. Okay, you get much better solutions. That's why, that's why we always want to work with orthogonal polynomials. Now this orthogonal business will form, uh, we, we looked at orthogonality, we looked at roots of the orthogonal polynomials in orthogonal collocations, right? So this, in this case here, if I use orthonormal set approximations are, you know, just taking inner products with the vector. In fact, what you have done here is find out the Fourier series coefficients. That's it. This is conceptually same, same as writing a vector V as Xi plus Yj plus Zk. That's all you have done. That's all you are generalized to any other dimensional space. If you remember this, that Fourier series is nothing but Xi plus Yj plus Zk extend it to any other space, that's enough, okay? So now you know how to make approximations. Not only that, you know how to make good approximations. You can make good approximations if you use orthogonal polynomials. That's why we are concerned about generating orthonormal series, orthonormal functions, orthonormal basis and so on. Okay, so now next class we will now start with the uh, with two things. One is uh, how is least squares used for developing different engineering models? I'll briefly go over that in the beginning and then move on to, you know, using uh, these methods for discretizing ODE boundary value problem or PD and, and so on. So this will lead to so-called, you know, Galarkin method or finite element methods, FEM. You may have, I'm not going to do full of FEM because that will consume rest of the semester. Uh, I am just going to touch the tip of the iceberg and say that this is what it is. Rest is for you to discover. Okay. So we continue in the next class about uh, more applications of orthogonality. <laughs>